Welcome to the Healthy Gut Podcast with Rebecca Coombs, the place where you can learn how to achieve a happy, healthy gut. Here's what's coming up on today's show. Hi, and welcome to episode 98 of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's just me today, Rebecca Coombs, and I'm here to talk about a subject I am very familiar with, and that is all about relapsing with SIBO. We're going to talk about why it happens and what you can do about it. (laughs) I have dealt with a relapsing case of SIBO now for five and a half years, so I know a little thing or two about it. But before we get stuck into today's topic, I did want to let you know about my SIBO um, five-week challenge, which I'm running at the moment. It's my Living Well with SIBO five-week challenge. Now, this program has really come about after the last five and a half years of me uh, not only dealing with my own SIBO, but working with people from all around the world and, and coaching them to learn to live well with SIBO and beyond. So when you sign up, you get a whole heap of resources. It's literally a huge brain dump of everything that I've learned along the way. But you also get to be part of a community of people who are going through the program with you. So each week, every day, there's a little bite-sized piece of information that gets released to you. So it's easy to digest, pardon the pun. Uh, And it's an easy way for you to learn quite a lot of information, but in a really manageable manner. We then support that with uh, several um, live events where you can tune in live listen to me talk, see um, some of our guest speakers as well, and also have the opportunity to ask your own questions. Now, it's absolutely fine if you aren't able to tune in live. There's always a replay available for people, but I know with my group that has just completed it, uh, they said that that was a real highlight for them. There's heaps of added value, so I've bundled up some um, of my books so that you can enjoy them as well. And uh, it has started. We started on Monday, the 28th of September, but you can still join. So I am still taking entrance for the first week. And after that, I close it off. Uh, So if you are interested in really learning as much as you can about SIBO, learning how I live well with SIBO and beyond, then this is the course for you. Now, I appreciate that you might not be ready to uh, dive into a course like that. So I thought I'd also let you know that I will be doing it in the lead up to the holiday season. I know that the holidays can be a really troublesome time when you're dealing with SIBO. It can feel really overwhelming when you have to think about coming together for Thanksgiving or Christmas or any of the holidays you may celebrate at that time of year and really uh, feeling quite overwhelmed over what to eat and how to manage, you know, just dealing with your families. So starting on the 2nd of November, I've got a very specific program that's going to run that's all about the holidays. So if you feel like you could really do with some extra help, I would love for you to join that course. Uh, Feel free to send me an email at rebecca at thehealthygut.com and then I can let you know more about that course. Now, don't forget as well that you can get access to the full transcription from today's episode. All you need to do is be a a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. It's absolutely free to join. And then you will receive access to all of the transcriptions from this season. So just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast and you can sign up as a member. And that's where you'll also find the show notes from today's episode. And if you would like to physically watch me doing today's episode, make sure you head to our YouTube channel, The Healthy Gut, and you'll be able to see my face as I'm talking to you rather than just hear my dulcet tones. (laughs) So let's dive into today's topic. So it's all around relapsing with SIBO. Now, like I said, I am well versed in this uh, aspect of living with SIBO. And in fact, two thirds of all SIBO patients, let's just repeat that because that's a big number, two thirds or 66% of all SIBO patients will experience a relapse once, twice, thrice or more. 
That's quite a big number when you really stop to think about how many people are dealing with SIBO and how many people then have to deal with SIBO again. When I first went through my SIBO treatment, I was really excited that I had cleared it. I, I, you know, did the classic type A personality, do it perfect, um, you know, try and be the best SIBO patient there ever was. And when I relapsed, I really struggled with that. I felt like a complete and utter failure. And I'd already commenced the healthy gut at that stage. And I felt like, you know, I can't go out and tell my people that I've relapsed when I've been talking about how I beat SIBO. And I felt really, really upset and downtrodden about it for quite a long time until I realized that actually relapse with SIBO is really common. And I was just like everybody else. I was just dealing with a relapse. So let's think about why relapse happens in the first place and, you know, what's occurring to allow that to happen. So if we go back to basics, what is SIBO? So SIBO is an overgrowth of bacteria or archaea in the small intestine. And that has occurred for one of generally two reasons. The one common reason is motility. So the migrating motor complex is not working efficiently to sweep out all of that bacteria and food and archaea and other things that come through the small intestine, and therefore it is allowed to overgrow. The second reason, and often we have both of these, that we have this overgrowth in the small intestine is there is a structural issue. So the anatomy of the small intestine is altered. And that can be because you've had an injury, you've had surgery. It might be because you've ended up with scar tissue like I do. You might might have blind loops uh, occurring in the small intestine. There can be a range of things that have altered the anatomy or the structure of the small intestine, which therefore allows pockets or areas where the bacteria can flourish and therefore we can end up with SIBO once again. And in much smaller cases, we can also have other diseases that might be leading or contributing to this overgrowth, but they're definitely the minority rather than the majority. And what is believed to be the case is the motility piece is really the number one reason why SIBO relapse occurs. So why can we end up with a relapse occurring? I think one of the most common reasons that I see uh, with my coaching clients uh, is that the underlying cause hasn't been addressed or can't be addressed and therefore the reason why the bacteria and archaea overgrow in the first place is still there and therefore the bacteria just flourishes again. And I like to uh, talk about an example with my coaching clients whereby we, if we think about our SIBO treatment as like putting a Band-Aid or a plaster over a cut area, but the thing that caused the cut, let's say there's a sharp object that we keep cutting ourselves on, well, that hasn't gone. And so the moment that that Band-Aid or that plaster is removed, we get a cut again. So that's the same kind of analogy as SIBO. So we can do a killing treatment where we're reducing the overgrowth. But if we don't then do any work around how do we improve the functioning and or structure of the gut, well, of course, the bacteria is going to overgrow again. And that was a really key piece that I just did not grasp the very first time I did my SIBO treatment. And I quite often see with my coaching clients that if they have quite a quick relapse with their SIBO symptoms, so they might have done a round of antibiotics or a round of herbs and they then get their symptoms back quite quickly, it can really show to us that the underlying reason has not been addressed. Another factor that I see commonly is that they're not actually on a uh, what I'd consider gold standard treatment protocol. I sadly all too often see people come to me desperate, feeling really unwell, often having done multiple rounds for many months of treatment, which they have believed 
was the right form of treatment for their SIBO. And it might be with very good intentions, they might be working with a practitioner who just perhaps isn't educated to the level they need to be on SIBO, not well versed on it or not experienced enough. Uh, And perhaps they haven't kept abreast with the latest research or following the leading doctors who are treating thousands of patients and, you know, clinically have so many hours working with complex cases that they can really, you know, with confidence talk about what are good treatment protocols for people with SIBO. And so I commonly see people come to me and when we look through their treatment options, I realise that, well, they haven't been put on what would be a gold standard treatment and no wonder they're actually not getting much resolution or seeing much activity change in their SIBO breath test results. Another common mistake I see is that they have been put on a form of treatment that would be absolutely fine if they were hydrogen dominant but they're methane dominant and they don't have that dual antibiotic or herbal protocol to treat both the hydrogen and the methane producers in their small intestine. And so again, they've got this ineffective or half-hearted treatment that just isn't providing the results that they really deserve to get. So that's a common reason why SIBO returns. I'm also seeing that people are put onto one round of treatment. They're told that's all they need to do, despite or regardless of what their actual breath test numbers are. They're sort of sent on their merry way. They're, you know, quite often I see this with uh, the antibiotic therapy with a more primary care or traditional doctor, like a GP, as we call them in Australia, or primary care physician, as they're known in the States. Uh, who perhaps just doesn't have a lot of experience around SIBO and knows of rifaximin or zifaxin but doesn't appreciate that sometimes it can take multiple rounds of treatment to fully uh, get the numbers of the overgrowth and the gas back down to what would be considered a kind of healthy or cleared from SIBO rate. And so they're put onto a course of therapy, sent on the merry way, and then bang, SIBO is, well, never gone. It's never cleared. And they're still feeling miserable and thinking, you know, I've successfully treated it, but why is it still there? Well, in fact, they haven't successfully treated it. They still have SIBO. uh, And they're just unfortunately working with a practitioner that just doesn't know enough. And this is why I personally like retesting myself. I like to see where are my numbers? Was the treatment that I just undertook effective? Was it not? Now, I don't always test, uh, having just said that I like testing, because I'm so in tune with my body now. I know very clearly what is SIBO and what isn't. But for people who are perhaps starting out on their journey, uh, who aren't perhaps as connected with their body, it can be really useful to test, A, to determine what type of SIBO you have, which therefore determines what type of treatment you need to do, But also once you've done a round or two of treatment to retest and see, was that effective? Have we cleared the SIBO and is it time to move on to the gut healing and repair phase or do we still need to stay in the killing phase? And I, and I see this commonly that the killing phase just is not undertaken correctly or for the right duration to truly get control of that overgrowth. Now, there are many people that I've worked with, with my coaching services, who have quite complex chronic cases of SIBO. And so for them, this treatment slash killing phase is often quite a long-term project. And we're looking at not only their test results, but more importantly, how they're feeling. Because if you take a year to get a SIBO test that would come back as negative, but you feel great within six months, well, we're going to hang on to how how good you're feeling and the improvements that you've made at the six-month mark, and then we'll work towards being able to get the small intestine working so that it can clear SIBO. Another common reason why people will relapse with SIBO is the underlying cause hasn't been identified or can't be identified. 
There are many reasons why we can end up with SIBO, but one of the most common is that we were exposed to an infection, like through food poisoning, that that has resulted in damage to the nerve cells, which therefore has resulted in this slowed motility or damage to the migrating motor complex. And therefore this overgrowth has been allowed to flourish. So if that's been the case, then the use of a prokinetic is really important. I personally have been using a prokinetic now for quite a few years. I rotate through all the various options. Uh, I know when I've interviewed Dr. Alison Seebecker, she's talked about how important the use of a prokinetic is. And if we look at the treatment algorithm that the likes of Dr. Pimentel and Seebecker and Dr. Um, Stephen Sandberg-Lewis have developed, Uh, the use of a prokinetic features heavily in that. And yet sadly, for some reason, I don't understand why, all too often when I have my coaching clients come to me and we talk about, you know, what prokinetic they're using, they're like, oh, I didn't know. I didn't, my doctor has said nothing about them. So sometimes we need to really advocate for ourselves here or do some research on our own or share with them links to, websites such as Dr. Alison Seebecker's SIBOinfo.com, which was originally written with the practitioner in mind, where we can share with them what is a prokinetic and what are the commonly used prokinetics that can help stimulate the movement in the gut to help stimulate and turn back on or support to better functioning the migrating motor complex so that We can reduce the overgrowth through the killing phase. Then we can really help to stimulate the movement and the function of the small intestine so that we can help either prolong or prevent a relapse from occurring because we're really supporting the MMC to push the food and the matter through so that it doesn't get stagnant and then um, just continue to overgrow. Now, I do have an episode just on the migrating motor complex with Dr. Alison Seebecker. So if you haven't listened to that, I would really encourage you to go and listen to it because we delve into that in a lot more detail. And when it comes to using a prokinetic, there are a couple of different schools of thought. Some practitioners will utilize a prokinetic during the killing phase. Others will wait until after the killing phase, and then they'll bring them in into that kind of repair um, and recovery phase of the gut. And it's really up to you and your practitioner to work out what's best for you. There's also different lengths of time that you may need to be on a prokinetic. Now, if you're someone that has relatively minor damage to the nerves in the gut and you just need to give it a bit of a kickstart to get back uh, working again, you might be on it for a few months. You might be someone whose gut needs more time to really recover and to learn how to work. So you might be on it for you know a year, for instance, or you might be someone like me who's got quite a lot of issues going on. The gut is really challenged in not only the nerve function and the motility, but also the structural side. And therefore a prokinetic for life or long-term might be required. And I fall into that category. So I need to take a prokinetic uh, uh, at all times so that I'm really stimulating the gut. I'm really giving it that support so it can work. I was doing a coaching call just recently and we were talking about the use of a prokinetic and I was likening it to, you know, if we were to break our arm, we'd put a plaster cast around our arm and we'd treat that arm with care and we'd have kind of a slow return to full function of the arm once the plaster cast comes off. On day one of the plaster cast being removed, we wouldn't then go out and do a really heavy weightlifting session. We might need to do some rehab on our arm to build up strength so that we can then ultimately get to that weight session that we'd like to do. Now, the same occurs for the gut. Just because we've completed the killing phase doesn't mean that our gut is ready for us to go back to what we might consider normal life. And that's where the prokinetic is likened to our rehab and recovery program. We're using our prokinetic to really help support and retrain, re-educate, strengthen the functioning of the gut so that ultimately 
the goal is that we can then get it working as it should. The other aspect for um, common causes of relapse are structural issues. And I'd mentioned that just before. What I often see with my coaching clients is they have had surgery or injury to the abdominal area, which has resulted in adhesions or scar tissue being laid down by the body as a protective mechanism, as a healing mechanism after injury, which surgery is an injury to the body. And that that scar tissue can then wrap itself around your intestines, your organs. It can pull and yank the structure of the internal cavity so that things aren't aligned as they should be. And it can therefore create little pockets or kinks where bacteria can overgrow. I don't know why, but so often uh, I'm working with people that have had surgeries. So things like having their appendix removed, they might have had gallbladder surgery. A, A very common one for women is a cesarean. And their doctors are making these incisions, be it keyhole surgery or a bigger surgery, and they're not being told of the risk of internal scar tissue. I've had four surgeries in my abdomen area and not one of those surgeons has ever explained the risk of adhesions to me. None of them. I had to discover adhesions myself through attending the SIBO conference in Portland, Oregon quite a few years ago where I heard Larry Wern talk about the work that he and his wife, Belinda Wern, do at Clear Passage Physical Therapy, helping people, they now work with a lot of SIBO patients, really recover from their surgery and these internal adhesions and constrictions. Now, if you haven't heard my uh, podcast episode with Larry and Belinda Wern, I really recommend you do. And head to the show notes because all of these podcasts are listed there so you can go and check them out. Uh, That interview is great because it really explains what adhesions are and how they work with them. I also work with a practitioner, Alyssa Tate, who's based in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, She specialises in visceral mobilisation and working with women with pelvic pain and a lot of um, kind of constriction in the pelvic area. She's absolutely wonderful. I, you know, feel so different after undertaking a session with her. And I've also got a podcast with her. So that just adds to the knowledge base around adhesions. Now, adhesions are a funny thing. They're um, they're really strong. <laughs> really, they are. They could carry a significant amount of weight, and they also exert a lot of pressure and pulling internally. So, if you ever feel like things get a little bit caught, or you feel a bit stuck, if you get pain that you can't explain, uh, a common one is a feeling of like a hot red poker up your bottom. Uh, then, the adhesions might be part of your picture. And if you cannot explain why your SIBO keeps relapsing, you've gone through the key areas, but you did have surgery at some point in your life, then I would really recommend being assessed physically for that. Now, you can either work with the worms at Clear Passage Physical Therapy or someone like Alyssa Tate, but you can also search for a visceral mobilization therapist. Uh, The Baral Institute does train people on this area and they can physically assess you as to whether you've got adhesions and if that might be part of the problem. That's a good question, hey? I've got loads more just like this coming up after this break. We'll be back in a moment. But you can also search for a visceral mobilization therapist. Uh, the Baral Institute does train people on this area and they can physically assess you as to whether you've got adhesions and if that might be part of the problem. But physical therapy just more broadly can also be really great at helping manually move things through our intestinal system and just freeing up the body as well. 
And if we think about SIBO as being this really stagnant issue, we've got this stagnation occurring in the small intestine, then it only reasons to, you know, think about physical therapy where we're moving the body, we're helping move the stagnation through the body can be really supportive for that as well. I personally, uh, when I'm not in a COVID-19 lockdown situation, as I have been now for pretty much this whole year, um, I do go and have physical therapy and I'm really, really missing it at the moment. Uh, And it makes an enormous difference. And for those of you that have constipation as part of your picture, as I do, because everything just gets so stuck within me, um, the use of the prokinetic, uh, also the use of magnesium, so larger bowel, and then the physical therapy is a really important kind of triple combo for me to help everything move through my system. We might be experiencing other diseases or conditions that are impacting our digestive tract that can also put us at greater risk of SIBO from developing in the first place and also relapsing. So any of the inflammatory bowel diseases will immediately put us at greater risk of SIBO. Uh, Diabetes will as well. Uh, And then things like diverticulitis will also um, mean that your risk to developing and then relapsing is increased. There's also the ileocecal valve. Now, this sometimes can create a bit of uh, heated discussion, and I know it pops up a lot in some of those kind of bigger SIBO Facebook groups and chat groups. Uh, but the ileocecal valve is a valve that connects the small and large in- in- the small and large intestine. So it's that juncture between the two parts of the intestinal system. And it is designed to be a one-way flow. So matter goes from the small intestine through to the large intestine, and then the valve should close to prevent backwash. But some people may have an issue with their ileocecal valve. They may have even had it removed through a resection of their intestinal system. And therefore, there's nothing preventing that matter from the large intestine where we have trillions of bacteria moving back up into the small intestine. There are physical therapy practitioners who are um, skilled and trained in feeling valves and junction points in our body. And you may be able to work with a practitioner that understands where the ileocecal valve is and really help to do some physical therapy on helping kind of close that back up. Along with these structural issues, we also need to think more broadly about our intestinal system. Now, when we have SIBO, we can get really fixated on the small intestine. I know I did. That's all I thought about. I didn't think about the large intestine. I didn't think about my stomach. I didn't even think about my mouth and my teeth and my chewing, which is the very start of our intestinal system. Our stomach is a really important kind of first holding point of food and matter as it before it goes into the small intestine. And what we want is it to have the right kind of pH balance or the right acidity to allow food to pass through and to also start to weed out some of that bacteria and the pathogens that we consume every single day just through general life. So you may find that you need to supplement uh, or you need to support the acid in your gut through the use of something like hydrochloric acid or ox bile. Um, And it's worthwhile having the Heidelberg test If you suspect that there is an issue with your stomach, it's worthwhile having the Heidelberg test to determine what the pH level of your gut actually is. Some of my clients talk about a feeling of food just sitting really heavily in their stomach that they feel like it just can't pass through. And you might like to try supplementing with hydrochloric acid or even apple cider vinegar. And if you feel like that's supporting you and and really helping you, then that can be an indicator that, yep, there is an issue with your acidity. 
Now, I always recommend you do work with a practitioner before you're doing anything because it's good to have them overseeing what you're doing medically so that there's also kind of a method to the process rather than just going out, throwing things at a wall and hoping it sticks. We may also need to use uh, digestive enzymes uh, and thinking about how we are bringing food in is also really important. So many of my clients are speed eaters. I was, I used to, I could have won awards for speed eating. So we, we are bringing food in in such a hurried manner and often not well chewed. So it hits the stomach. It's quite unchewed and it's asking a lot of the digestive process. So when it gets into the small intestine, there's even more work for the gut to do. One of the exercises I do with my clients to really help support that return to better health and functioning of the gut is a visualization, deep breathing and chewing exercise. So before food has even gone into your system, you're thinking about the digestion of it and that can really help to stimulate your body's natural digestive enzymes and processes to get ready for eating food. We want to support the nervous system so that you are moving into a rest and digest mode versus a fight or flight mode because when we are very stressed, our stress response will mean that our digestive process is slowed or impaired because we don't need to be digesting food if we need to survive. Uh, the only problem is that in today's world with this chronic stress that we experience, we our body doesn't know that we don't have that saber-toothed tiger chasing us anymore. It's just general life. So really calming down to eat and not being stressed when we bring food in uh, is important. And then chewing. I can't talk enough about the importance of chewing and slowly eating. So an exercise I do with my clients is that we, um, like I said, do the visualization, deep breathing, and then it's one mouthful of food at a time, knife, fork, spoon, whatever implement you're using to eat with goes down. You actually stop holding it. You put it down completely so that you chew that mouthful of food before touching your utensils again to pick up the next bite. And you're having a real focus on chewing it well so that you're not putting food that's only partially chewed into your stomach and therefore asking much more of your damaged gut. So if we think about that broken arm, you wouldn't go and do weights with your broken arm because your bone is broken. So why are we asking our gut to work like the average gut when it's broken? Let's help our gut by bringing in food in a way that's going to be more supportive of it. And this cannot, this is also really important in the recovery phase, so straight out of treatment that we're really thinking about what we're doing nutritionally to help support a damaged and recovering gut. So what can you do to prevent a relapse? You might be listening to this and be starting out on your SIBO journey and wanting to prevent relapse as much as possible. Well, the number one thing I would say, uh, in addition to everything I've just been talking about, is work with a practitioner who is skilled at SIBO, someone who has worked with many people, has dealt with many different cases of SIBO, who's keeping up to date with the most recent research on SIBO itself and IMO, as it's now called, for methane dominance, and that they can bring a sweet of experience to the table when dealing with you. One of the most common reasons for relapse is that a person has dealt, has worked with a practitioner that just is not knowledgeable enough on all things SIBO. So I can't stress that enough. If you're wondering where do I go and find a practitioner, well, the first place to look at is all of the people that I have interviewed on the Healthy Gut podcast. All of those people are practitioners themselves. Um, or you can book in for a coaching session with me. And what I commonly do is help people find the right practitioner for them. So I'm often a conduit between practitioner and patient. And I love connecting people with the right kind of practitioner for them, because I really believe that the practitioner needs to fit with you. Not only do they need to have the experience, but they need to have the right personality for you. If you're someone who likes a really direct, no-nonsense practitioner, I will help you find that person. 
Whereas if you're someone that needs a caring, soft approach with a practitioner, then I'll also help you find that person. It's really important that you retest, do retest, 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 retest if you feel you need to. You know, it's funny I'm saying this in the next breath, but don't get hung up on the test results as such. Use them as part of the diagnostic process. Remember that this is a really interesting science experiment of one, and that is you. But retesting will give you the insight as to what's going on. It doesn't mean success or failure necessarily. It's just an insight into what's happening with you. Another important aspect to prevent relapse is around having a really clear plan in place around the treatment, but also the maintenance and recovery and the gut healing protocols that you go into next. So just because you've got that all clear breath test does not mean that the work is over. In fact, it might just be beginning. And I often use the analogy of peeling back the layers of an onion. For me, the SIBO diagnosis was that very first layer. And since discovering I had SIBO, I have learned so much more about my body and various conditions that are now that I now realize I have that are also interplaying with each other. You may need to do some work around healing the lining of the gut. You may need to work on the brush border enzymes uh, and healing the brush border components of the gut because SIBO really does damage that. Uh, You may have some other food intolerances or allergies that you also need to address. You might have some other conditions that are now more, more important to deal with now that the overgrowth is under control. You may need to be looking at, you know, what is causing all of these issues in your body and really delving in uh, or diving in further to start addressing them as well. And nutritionally, you know, it's not like we clear SIBO and then you can go back out to just eating junk food. And I think sometimes that people are too quick to expand their diet. They have a huge increase in their symptoms it then makes them feel very disheartened and they think, oh my gosh, I'm never going to get through this. When in fact, you know, we've got to remember that it's the tortoise and the hare and we we want to be the hare. We want to be racing forward, achieving this optimal health, reaching a finishing line and then being done with it. But in fact, we're in an ultra marathon here and the the finishing line is the day we take our last breath. We're not in a race to get to this optimal health at some point in time because it is forever evolving and changing for us. Instead, what we're looking to do is to improve and recover and uh, feel great again, but we can't take our eye off the ball. We've got a damaged gut. We've got a gut that is susceptible to an overgrowth, so we need to treat it carefully. So like when you take the um, cast off your arm, that you need to do rehab and rebuild the strength. Well, we need to do rehab and rebuild the strength in our gut as well. And that in itself can take time. Some of the other activities that we need to focus on in that maintenance and repair stage to help prevent relapse will be around movement. So how are you moving your body? Are you moving your body Are you perhaps even moving your body too much? What's the stress picture in your life like? If you have dealt with chronic stress for a long period of time, identifying how you can start to deal with that, identifying tips and techniques that you can implement on a day-to-day basis to calm your nervous system, to be in rest and digest as much as possible will ultimately help prevent or prolong a relapse for you. And then sleep, that all important sleep. If you're giving your body time to recover, then it's going to have a better chance at recovering from SIBO than if you are staying up way too late and just not getting enough sleep. And we do know there are some pharmaceuticals that are um, sadly um, connected with an increase in relapse or an increase in the development of a condition like SIBO, particularly proton pump inhibitors, narcotics, uh, and and those types of um, medications that can really slow down or impair the functioning of the gut. 
So where possible, avoiding them, uh, you know, things like antibiotics, you know, really only using them when absolutely necessary uh, is really important as well. I'd also recommend looking at the broader gut. So what's happening in the large intestine? Um, In the repair and recovery phase, that can be a great time to look at pre and probiotics uh, and nutritional therapy to really support the broader microbiome. Uh, I personally have done quite a lot of stool assessments. So I've got a pretty clear picture of what's going on in my broader gut. And I now have a very kind of therapeutic approach to eating. Uh, So I choose foods specifically that I know are designed to help support feed the good guys in my gut, so to speak. And I also have a very tailored uh, pre and probiotic therapy to, again, help provide the good guys with the right kind of fuel uh, and also help support uh, some of those colonies with the probiotics. So what do you do if you find yourself relapsing? Well, don't do what I did. Don't freak out. I mean, I I think I literally cried for days. I was so upset and I felt like such a failure. Uh, Remember that two-thirds of us will relapse with SIBO at least once, if not multiple times. And just because we have relapsed, it doesn't mean the world is ending. The great thing is you now know about SIBO. You didn't used to know about it. You used to suffer in silence or you used to suffer with everybody telling you there was nothing wrong with you. It was all in your head. Now you know about SIBO. Hopefully you've also got a practitioner on board who can help you with the treatment of it. So the quicker you get onto your relapse, the quicker you can feel better. Now I relapse generally once a year, maybe twice a year if it's been a tough year. And whilst no one wants to relapse, I actually find that the relapses and my symptoms, well, they never get to what they used to. And that's because I get onto it really quickly. So I will call my na- my naturopath and say, oh, it feels like SIBO is back. And we get straight into a round of herbal antimicrobials. And then I am on that for generally about four to six weeks. Um, I'll do one to two rounds of that, depending on symptomatically how I feel. And like I said, I don't do retesting all the time because I'm so in tune with my body that I I really know when I've got SIBO, but also once it's cleared, I'm almost like a hyper uh, feeler. I've got visceral hypersensitivity, so I really do feel things. My mum used to say to me, Rebecca, you are the princess and the pea. It doesn't matter how many mattresses are over that pea, you will always feel it. And it's really nice to now know that there's a name for it. It's not just being a very sensitive person, <laughs> which I am anyway. Uh, so I get on to that re- um, return round of SIBO treatment really quickly. From a diet perspective, I luckily uh, can now eat quite a lot of foods, but when I have a relapse, I'll pull back on my foods and really just help to calm my system down. So I'll reduce those carbohydrates in my diet because they're just really easy fuel for bacteria. Uh, And then I'm just really focusing on that nutritional support, lots of sleep, plenty of water, moving my body so that I'm, uh, you know, not aggravating. And I have experienced stress when I'm in the midst of a SIBO flare. And I tell you what, guys, my symptoms are 10 times worse when I've had a really stressful day or if a stressful thing has occurred when my SIBO is also present. So I do what I can to try and eliminate or or at least um, counteract stress. It can also help you really get focused on identifying or treating the why when you have a relapse. So I now know that such a big part of my picture are these internal um, adhesions. So I now really focus on treating them. I used to be really focused on treating the overgrowth. Now I'm really focused on treating the underlying cause of why I have SIBO in the first place. And I hope one day I'm able to have them treated successfully so that I no longer have all of this constriction and restriction in my abdominal cavity and that my small intestine can finally get back to a good working order. 
But you know what? That might not ever happen for me. That's my goal, but it might not happen for me. So what I will do in the interim, and it might be till the day I take my last breath, is that I'll just manage this condition. And even though I'm managing it and I haven't been able to rectify it completely at this stage, I still feel so much better than I did when I first had SIBO. And I hope that gives you hope for those of you that are perhaps relapsing for the first time or you haven't yet relapsed and you're terrified to relapse. You know, as a chronic relapser on the other side of the fence, I just want you to know that life's not so bad over here and you can do a lot with your life and still have SIBO. I'm truly a testament to that. If you'd like to connect with other people with SIBO, and I really feel that community is a really important part of that, then I do encourage you to join my five-week program, my Living Well with SIBO five-week challenge, which is on now. We're in our first week, so you've got a couple more days to join before we close off entries until the next round. So if you're keen to join, head to thehealthygut.com and you will learn more about the program and you can sign up immediately. I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast, episode 98 of the Healthy Gut Podcast, all about SIBO relapse and what you can do to prevent it. Don't forget you can get the full transcription from today's episode just by becoming a member of the Healthy Gut Podcast. Just head to thehealthygut.com forward slash podcast so that you can get today's transcription and all of the transcriptions from season three. I look forward to coming to you next week with yet another episode of the Healthy Gut Podcast. You've been listening to the Healthy Gut Podcast with your host, Rebecca Coombs. To learn more about the Healthy Gut or our podcast, head to thehealthygut.co forward slash podcast. We would like to thank Red Lemon Productions for the production and original music score of this podcast. To find out more about their services, head to redlemonproductions.com. The Healthy Gut Podcast is a production of The Healthy Gut. Thanks for listening. Thank you.